game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Hi everyone, welcome to the first edition of Ramdas Here and Now for 2019. And Happy New Year everybody. I, uh, I did a podcast uh, on my Mind Rolling podcast, which you can check out on the Be Here Now network. And it was, uh, it was all about bringing forward the hippie credo from the late 60s, early 70s, which we have dismissed out of hand, unfortunately. But I think we need um, to reinstate it. And so uh, this is, uh, it was my uh, Happy New Year slogan <laughs> on Mind Rolling. And I want to do it on Ram Dass Here and Now. And what it is, is it's from the Elvis Costello song, Nick Lowe wrote, What's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? And that's what I want to know about how we can bring that back. Not like it's gone, not like it left the planet, but uh, just think about the understanding part, right? There's not much of that going on in this country. So, I don't want to get pedantic here, but I'm happy to uh, start the new year out with a wonderful talk. Uh, this goes back, this talk, uh, to, it was right around the first talk that I ever heard of Ram Dass from 69, 70. Can you believe? 1969, 19, this was from early, 1970, January. Uh, and I'm going to get into it in a minute, but I want to... Uh, I want to thank 1440 Multiversity. Go to 1440.org. I want to thank them for all the support that we got from them last year and all the wonderful presentations that they do at their uh, wonderful center near Santa Cruz, California. If you can make it out there, it's just absolutely gorgeous, and they have incredible presenters. Uh, one of them is somebody that I have done a podcast with, and I've mentioned her more than once, Shefali Tsaberi, Dr. Shefali. And uh, she's going to be doing mindfulness and meditation retreat uh, not too far from now, so you can still sign up. Go to 1440.org, and you will... Uh, get uh, all of the information you need to register. And I saw something else, which is a little later in the month of January, and it's somebody I have no idea, I have never heard of him, Gary Van Warmerdam, Warmerdam, and he's doing something called Hacking Core Belief. So it really struck me. Uh, he said, do you feel derailed by a sabotaging force you can't even see? Neuroscience tells us that unconscious beliefs and impulses drive 90% of our behaviors and emotional reaction. Since I've been really hot in the last number of months, as those of you who have heard me on Mind Rolling, know about how to, uh, yeah, how do we unpack the habitual patterns that we have created that create this story of me? So go check out 1440.org. That could be an interesting... Uh, i got to get him on a podcast, actually. Um, any other announcements? We do have... Oh, this is a big announcement. We do have this wonderful course that was taken from a retreat we did in Maui last uh, spring, actually, that included Roshi Joan Halifax, Frank Ostaseski, and Robert Thurman, along with Ram Dass... Krishna Das, myself, Duncan was there, 
Duncan Trussell, and it's no death, no fear, or no fear, no death. I think that's what it was. Anyhow, we've taken the the primary focused um, discussions that happened at that retreat and put them together in a four-week course that's easily digestible, as they say. So uh, make sure you're on the uh, the ramdas.org email list because you will get an email. It's free, and uh, it's uh, really powerful, really powerful, and uh, covers a, a lot of different subjects under that banner, uh, basically getting into a place where we are not walking around in fear uh, from the smallest things to the biggest thing, obviously, fear of losing your body and your mind. So, take a look out for that. Now, here we go. This is, again, this is like nostalgia for me because it, it, it's a talk that is right around the time that I heard that first talk of Ram Dass. And uh, so, it's very direct. I, I think I want to call it the eternal present because it's, it's a lot about be here now. It really is. Uh, where's that part? The purification methods are there to help, but they are all traps. They help you bring. They help bring you into a new psychic space. And purification methods, anything from meditation, yoga, chanting, studying, text, etc., etc., and they all, all hurt because they catch you in models of how you think it is. Again, going back to uh, you know the deep resolve we have to be uh, ensconced in the trap of the movie of me. Uh, how you think it is. And those models are keeping you from being here, and I put in parentheses, now all the time. So this is like, this is before, well, Be Here Now was written over the period of 6970, maybe part of, yeah, 6970, Ram Dass gave, came back and he gave a bunch of talks over the year of 68, 69, and then it, they started to uh, compile them and did that whole box set in 1970, and it wasn't until 71 that Be Here Now is a, a just a, just the book came out. Ah. <sighs> The days of yore, huh? <laughs> Meister Eckhart is how he quotes, he starts off this talk quoting, if you don't know Meister Eckhart, that is something else to pursue. He was a Christian mystic. He's got, uh, he, he's got wonderful, wonderful um, core insight that is well beyond any kind of uh, Christian uh that I ever heard of a Christian that I never heard anyone quite like him. I remember back then when, when I went to India is when I discovered Meister Eckhart. Of course, that's because of Maharaji. Neem Karoli Baba telling us all about there is only one Christ, Hanuman, all one. Uh, and in this quote from Ram Dass, it's really basically about any way you get to God is good. In fact, if you have one way and then suddenly change that way, it's okay. It's all right. Changing paths. What it boils down to is rest and security through evenness. I love that. Um, and so basically this talk goes on. Look, once, you've, uh, once you wake up in this lifetime, that seems to be the unfolding of what it is that we are here for. He says, it's unfolding of a flower we have seen blooming before. It's like deja vu. Once you know the possibility, once you know the seed has been planted, once you realize it's not how you thought it was, boy, that was a joy when I found that out, then starts a long process of purification. In India, that purification is called tapasya which is like abrasive, like sandpaper. It's doing practices that 
wear out this wrong view. I mean, is one way to say it. Uh, it wears out the surety of the thought that you have that this is how it all is. And he tells that great story, the subway story, where pe- you're going, you go down, you get there a little earlier, and you go, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but you go down, you get there a little earlier, and then you see the sign says, whoops, no exit here, and you go back up, and then everybody, you know, 3,000 people are coming down those stairs, and no way are they going to believe you that there's no exit. <laughs> so great. I've heard it a billion times, by the way, and it still gets me. Uh... And he talks about all the methodology about getting high, sex, drugs, pranayama, hatha yoga, meditation. Uh, It's and all we do is get we get on a on a method and we get hooked on getting high. That's why I I always I have this little thing about um, a little jousting I do with people who are. I have lots of friends who do psychedelics a lot, and I'm always like. Okay, isn't there's a little bit of, you know, uh, you're going to come down. And, you know, that getting high means there's a down. Uh, and he calls it the absolute refractory period. <laughs> you go up, you come down. Uh, but more to the point is when uh, we get hooked on all of these things, not just psychedelics. We get hooked on pranayam, you know, and it's... Uh, all uh, the use of the senses and thinking mind keeps you in time and space, Ramdas says. And you only get out for a moment, which is what, Ramda, uh, what Maharaji said about taking uh, acid. You know, get you into a room with darshan of Christ for a couple hours, then you got to leave. So he talks a lot about that. And, and here's something. Every label of what you think you need is all a statement of who you think you are. And that all turns out to be wrong. So this is a lot about, uh, as I mentioned before, that gentleman who's giving that uh, retreat over in uh, 1440, unpacking, I love that word. This is about unpacking all of the surety and of ideas of who we think we are and what it is all about. And uh, um, getting into the not knowing is very difficult because of, of fear of impermanence uh, and other, other qualities that we find very dear. But uh, getting into the not knowing is a very very uh, positive turn of events for us. Uh, and um, there's uh, the, the Tibetans talk a lot about uh, ignorance, of course, as the cause of suffering, but even more so, uh, as Bob Thurman said in a retreat uh, this past year, uh, even more so is the thought that you know right? That's really terrifying because you're so solidly, we, we, not you, we are so solidly ensconced in this uh, illusion that we think we know what reality is. Or we, I mean, very simple things. We think we know when we go into a room, we know what, uh, uh, what people are going through in any one moment. Uh, and it's all projections from ourselves. Uh, and uh, as as Bob had said at one point, just imagine if you were part of the all-pervasive reality as a Neem Karoli Baba, as a Buddha, a Christ, you would be inside every person collectively, interconnected with every person and unless you were obviously completely free you'd go out of your mind so this notion that we think we know is really a toughie a big toughie and that's why we do these practices and we do these austerities to unpack all of that and uh, just always have that caveat going that whatever we do is ultimately another 
trap because we believe that's the only way. And that's why we get a lot of people saying, well, if you do this, you'll be fine. I do it. I go, if you do Vipassana meditation, uh, you'll get a grip on that monkey mind, which is true. But uh, what's not true is the evangelistic part that we all seem to uh, take great joy in. Anyhow, here's Ramdas from 1970. It's an oldie but goodie. It's my nostalgia opening um, talk of Ramdas for uh, 2019. Boy, time is flying. Huh? This is Ramdas here and now on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you'll see the plethora of fantastic talks. Sorry for the phone. See you next week. Meister Eckhart, whatever the way that leads you most frequently to awareness of God, follow that way. And if another way appears, different from the first, and you quit the first and take the second, and the second works, it's all right. It would be nobler and better, however, to achieve rest and security through evenness by which one might take God and enjoy him in any manner, in anything, and not have to delay and hunt around for your special way. That has been my joy. To this end, all kinds of activities may contribute and any work may be a help. But if it does not, let it go. St. John of the Cross, all that the imagination can imagine and the reason conceive and understand in this life is not and cannot be a proximate means of union with God. We cannot talk about <clears throat> the goal because words are all lies in relation to that state which we know of as possible. What we can share tonight, as we shared in this tabernacle some months back, and we'll share in the next few weeks, our means or methods. Primarily, they turn out to be methods of purification. Most of us have experienced getting our heads through the door, doorway into the kingdom of heaven, but our bodies just won't fit. Some of us got our hearts into heaven, but our minds wouldn't fit. There is a lovely saying, do not, do not make friends with an elephant keeper unless you have room in your home to entertain an elephant. But unfortunately, what brings you here is that you and I have all made friends with an elephant keeper. We already have this huge elephant in our living room, and now we are into the care and feeding of elephants, whether we like it or not. 
there is something awesomely irreversible about the journey we are sharing. Evolution just doesn't seem to go backwards. And the evolution of consciousness and the waking up in this very lifetime is what seems to be what we are about. How many lifetimes each of us have been through to bring us to this point? For many of us, we haven't yet caught up where we, to where we were last time. And so there is something vaguely familiar about everything that's going down. It's not quite deja vu, although many of us have experienced that. But it feels like an unfolding of a flower that you have seen in bloom before. But what happened the last time for all of us by definition of the fact that we are here on this plane at this moment sharing psychic space at this vibrational rate is that we didn't finish. So here we are again. Remember last time? Same trip. Except we were all just a little bit less conscious. And as we meet here for the next 10,000 lifetimes, we will each Note that we get a little more conscious till finally the hall is empty because we will all turn into butterflies, as the Tibetans suggest. Once the seed's been planted, once you know of a possibility, once you understand that it wasn't at all the way you thought it was, then starts a long and complex undertaking of purification. Now the purification is intensified for you by what's called uh, tapasya, or austerities. And austerities come in funny packages. What it really means is something abrasive, like sandpaper that tends to refine you. The image that I've been working with these past few weeks that is so meaningful to me and to many of you, I'm sure, is the one of a stairway. You have been in a building or you're going into a subway, and the rush hour is at five o'clock, and at five o'clock, thousands of people come down the stairway. And you've decided to leave a little early to beat the rush. So it's around 10 minutes of five, and you go running down this long, long, long stairway. Those of you that have been in New York subways know that long, long stairway. You get to the bottom, and there is a sign that says, this exit closed. Use the exit across the street, or use the stairway on the other side of the building. Now, what I usually do on these conditions is I look around to see if there's a way to slip by. And then I don't find one. And then you turn around and you start to go up the stairs, and at that moment it's five o'clock. And now down the stairs comes a mass of humanity. 
and you're now on about the 20th step. And you say to the people, <laughs> now, if you were one of the people coming down the stairs, would you believe you? <laughs> You say to somebody, uh, and they look at you like you are insane. Now, you're in a funny predicament, see? because you might do one of a few things. You might go back down to see if you read it wrong. I mean, there's a possibility that you just imagine it, because all these people can't all be going in the wrong direction. But you know. You saw the sign. You read it. You trust your senses. You saw the sign, and it said, this exit doesn't lead out. And because you know that, all you can do is sort of stand there. You can't go backwards down the steps because that's obviously absurd. But yet the wave of humanity is such that you can just barely stay there and maybe move a step. And every now and then you catch somebody's eye and they look at you quizzically and you say, the sign says, and they hear you. You say, oh yeah? because you look honest. Now, but you see, the strength of their commitment is different than yours, because you saw the sign. All they did was hear your report of the sign. See, that's pretty abrasive. It's pretty abrasive because so many people are telling you you're wrong. You go to a university, go to a nice middle-class university, not a, another kind. And everybody is coming down those stairs, going for the degree going for the achievement, for the success, for the external payoff. You already saw that sign. It says, this exit is closed. Sorry, this one doesn't lead to where you thought you were going. meet people who have, who are achieving in life economically in order to gain security, in order to feel that feeling. And you've seen the sign and you know that when they get it all, it's not going to be enough. How do you say to somebody, how do you say to a 50-year-old man who has spent 30 years building a business, building security, all on the basis of the Protestant ethic of work now, enjoy later, how do you say to him, uh, it's not going to be what you thought later? Do you think he gets any solace from the smiling ads of senior citizen communities? We'll all have fun together as kids again, because we've finished the trip successfully. We all have our boat on our trailer on the back of our camper. Our children are in college, our insurance is paid up, and now, now comes the fun.
You think it's enough fun? Recently, I was camping in a state park, which during the week is like a mobile senior citizen community. And dozens of people kept going by me and saying, oh, you come from New Hampshire. Oh, you're a long way from home. <laughs> it felt as poignant to me as it felt some years back when I was playing gin rummy on a yacht off the Florida coast with one of my father's wealthier friends for a penny a point. And he was building all new factories in the South. And I said, why are you building all these new factories? You're in your 70s, you've made millions of dollars. And he said, what else am I gonna do? It's the difference between my mother saying to me when I was a child coming home from school, not what's happening to you inside, are you learning something? But what did the teachers say about you? How are you doing? How are you doing externally? Are you making it? Are you making it? You got a pretty chick? You got green energy? Got it made? Got it cooled out? Is it enough? The rushing headlong down the stairs, and it's only on the 20th step of 150 steps. See, you're only the 20th step from the bottom. We're getting very near the bottom as a culture with our super affluence and our and television and freeways. We're getting right to the point where we're getting all the stuff that the books said if you did your thing, you'd get. Social security, guaranteed minimum, guaranteed annual wage. Turn on a tube in your home and bring in Frank Sinatra and Jackie Gleason on Saturday night. Smothers Brothers in the old days. Get in a high-powered box and move anywhere else you want so that the whole society is hugely mobile. Find a beach you can swim naked at. Find people you can make love to pretty much when you want to now. You imagine somebody in the 1890s in Freud's hometown, I mean, you know, had Freud lived that way, the whole second chakra description that he's laid down for us, he wouldn't have bothered because there wouldn't be anybody stuck at the second chakra. We're just about getting to the point where everybody is getting enough of what they thought they wanted. And then comes the horror show. Then comes the tranquilizers, the sleepless nights, the kind of desperate, desperate grasping. Give me another kiss. Love me some more. What's happened to our family? We don't stay together enough. And the new car sits in the garage, and the speedboat sits on the rack. Television sets turned off. And the new ranch house cooks the coffee, and makes the eggs, and does the toast, and does the washing. And the husband and wife sit encased in a plastic horror. A horror that they wanted, that's the horror of it. <clears throat> oh, 
Oh, but it's very easy to scapegoat them. The problem is that them is us. See, oh, maybe it's not a plastic ranch house. Maybe it's a groovy pad with Indian hangings. Candles and incense. Groovy clothes. High-vis clothes. Saturday nights at the Fillmore and the family dog. Lots of time drifting around. Really good grass. I mean, really good. It's got <laughs> so that you can just reach from the hookah for the hookah from your bed in the morning. <laughs> I mean, you've got it beat. Groovy hi-fi. You know, earphones in bed next to your, what, amyl nitrate or whatever. <laughs> Lots of good friends to hang out with. <coughs> Groovy books to collect more stuff. Pretty far out films showing up. Infinite number of places you can get high in. The ocean, camel pies. The park, the apartment, bed, bathtub, parachuting, scuba diving. When is it enough? When have you collected enough experiences? Want some more? <laughs> Lifetimes. No rush. Maybe a few more experiences will do it. Do what? Not get you high. We all know how to get high. I mean, everybody here at least must know how to get high. We all get high off something or other. Everybody has their trip. Do you ever hang out around surfers? I mean, surfers really get high. You get on top of that wave, you've got to turn off your head to get on top of a wave like that, to really ride it. Transcendent experience, me and this huge amount of energy. Perfect harmony to this energy. Wow, is that addicting. Man, surfing's the way. It's all I want to do for the rest of my life is surf. <laughs> or maybe your trip's sex. You think surfing's good. <laughs> there's that moment when there's only four arms and four legs and two bodies and one consciousness. And at that moment, that's what it is about. It's enough. It's the place. It's, yeah. Oh, here again. Whew. You don't say it at that moment. You don't sit around saying, ah, I'm here again. <laughs> but afterwards you say, oh, yeah, that was it. That was it. Oh, you all know that place, probably by now. Most of you. Maybe your trip is science. I mean, you get on through solving problems. You just won the Nobel Prize. Oh, oh, God. Oh, does that feel good? Oh. 
I wish it would last forever. <laughs> now, what are your plans for the future? <laughs> Don't dally in ecstatic bliss, the instructions say. <laughs> Ecstasy bliss is just another astral trip. What's your trip? Art, music, oh, music. Really go out on music. Music's the way. Man, you don't play music? Wow, you're really missing something. Every one of those methods, including pranayam and hatha yoga and prayer in church and scuba diving and motorcycling, it all does it for somebody or other. It takes everybody to here and now. We all know how to get high some way or other. So now we don't have to spend time lecturing and discussing how to get high. Now the other question gets more interesting. Why do you come down? See, it isn't getting high anymore, it's being high. I mean, I don't want to get high where there's a low. I would like to be. Be. Just be here now, always, in the eternal present. It's that place, it's that place, it's what all those things lead to. The problem for most of us, and of course I've left out one of the major methods of getting high in our, my little list here, is of course drugs, chemicals, altering states of consciousness, chemicals, psychedelics. They get you high. But almost every one of these things I've mentioned has what's known as an absolute refractory period. It doesn't give you a constant state of high. It makes you live like a roller coaster. Up and down. And up and down. And it's only when the downs are as high as the ups that you started to beat the system. Up until then, all you are is hooked on your upaya. You're hooked on your method of getting high. Sex, drugs, pranayama, hatha yoga, scuba diving, solving problems, driving motorcycle. Walking in the park, music. The distinction is that every one of these things, every one of these uses of the senses or the thinking mind to transcend the senses and the thinking mind, works, but it always, because you have used the senses and the thinking mind, keeps you in time and space and only lets you out for a moment. And every one of these things, just like the thorough enjoyment of the Divine Mother, the total honoring of this exquisite being that is called nature, that includes all of this, all of this, the honoring, loving, and worshiping of it, is only really possible when you are free of attachment to it. When you need your method to get high, it will never be enough. 
It'll be enough for a moment, but it won't be enough. See, most of, or a good number of people, have pretty well cooled out their lives at this point. They have to work a few hours a week. They've got enough bread, enough food. Good scene, they have the scene they visualized. They've got a good, good old lady or old man. Maybe kids, some dogs, maybe a goat for milk. Good food. I mean, there are people that are living exquisitely, exquisitely. They don't appear in House Beautiful, but they appear in, uh, in uh, the Oracle section on communes. The new House Beautiful. Or well, the ex-new House Beautiful. But the problem for most people that are gathered here at this moment is that all of their habits of thought or models about how they'd like it to be does not bring them to exactly the same place that there is some place inside of them that tells them is the way it is. It doesn't quite bring it there because all of their models are coming out of one plane of reality and what they are tasting of and starting to live at is another plane of reality. In fact, most of us are living pretty much of the time on the astral plane. We are keeping our bodies cooled out and it's all in order, but we are starting to live more and more in the astral plane. But our models about how you do it and what you're looking for and what's enough are all from another plane, from another time. So there is a slight malaise in many people because it isn't quite right. Now, the funny thing about it is, about that Divine Mother, who's offering all these blessings of music, light, flowers, spring and fall, and life and death, and the richness of the drama of every moment, is that when something has happened to you inside, it is all enough. But when you go to the Divine Mother to make it enough, it isn't enough. It's the way it works. As long as you think that what you're looking for is outside of yourself, it will never be enough. It's the way it works. What do you need? What do you need to make it all, all right? need a companion? You need some stimulation? You need something to turn you on? You need groovy food? I need simple food to stay high. I, mean, I really need rice and vegetables. Is that what you need? What do you need? What do you need? Every label you have of what you think you need is all a statement of who you think you are, and that all turns out to be wrong. That's the predicament we find ourselves in. I mean, we've shared away most of the stuff. Most of us don't need um, uh, Paul Masson with dinner, and we don't need bouillabaisse to keep ourselves high with special garlic sauces, and we don't need, you know, Chablis with our fish and the fish with mushrooms and cheese. We don't need all that. And we say, somebody says, I really need, you know, and you say, oh, and you feel sorry for them. Say, I mean, for me, man, it's very simple. I just live in rice and vegetables and, you know. 
just substituting one ego trip for another. <laughs> I'm macrobiotic. <laughs> sure, it's groovy. All of the methods like diet and so on, the purification things are useful and necessary to help you, but beware they are all traps as well. Every one. You think being here and listening to this business isn't? You think something's happening to you? This is just an external trip. It's another one. It's another one. They all help and they all hurt. They all help in that they bring you more often and closer into a certain kind of new psychic space more of the time and they all hurt because they all catch you in models of how you think it is. And those models are what is keeping you from being here all the time. This scene. Who are you? If you think you are somebody listening to somebody speak, forget it. You're really in the wrong place. It's just another trip. I'm just sitting in this space, just here, watching this whole thing go down. I don't care. How could I care? How could I care? Don't you have a sense of social responsibility? <laughs> it won't help. I have enough of a sensual sense of social responsibility to realize that I can't afford to care. Because if I'm hustling you, all you're going to do is get paranoid. That's what the Gita says. Not in those words, but that's... <laughs> See, Meister Eckhart reassures us. He says, it's all all right. Because all of this is part of the process of awakening. When you see how it is, and at the same moment, it is all irrelevant. Let me try to clarify that. Something has happened to you and to me that brings us together at this moment on this plane. Not really together in oneness yet, but in all of our manifestations. With some, we're living at two levels in this room. I mean, we all dig we're here. At the same moment, we're all being our thing. We're all playing our parts from central casting. And once that seed has been planted, as Ramakrishna says, then from then on, there is like with a, an earthworm looking for food, there is a scanning, searching mechanism. You're looking, always, for the next message, for the sign that says, magic theater for madmen only, price of admission, your mind. Sometimes you walk by the wall and it's not there because your head isn't there. But it turns out that whatever you are doing 
is what you're doing and it's happening anyway. People say to me over and over again, if you don't share time with me, if you don't help me, or if I don't get to an ashram or something, I say, what if? Well, uh, I say, well, go ahead and do it. They say, I mean, it's going to become terrible. I'm going to lose my center. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to forget. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to become unconscious. I'm going to become a mechanical man. I'm going to become an automaton. I'm going, whatever the metaphor is, going to lose the spirit. Go ahead and try. Go ahead and try. You can't do it. Oh, you can do it for a few moments. Some of us would really like to, too. See, we woke up, we saw a possibility, and then you're zonked. It's like you've been taken over, if you want to really go paranoid. That's the paranoid trip. The Martians have just, you know, done it. They've implanted. Then from then on, you are a different being. You can do it in the other metaphor of Christ, which doesn't get you as paranoid. It, it could, <laughs> however. <laughs> which says, he that is born of the flesh is of the flesh, and he that is born of the spirit is of the spirit. And then he says, lest ye be born again, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. See, we of the spirit all got born into these nature packages, got born into the illusion, got born into our desires, our needs. I need rice and vegetables. I need drugs. I need a chick. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need sucking. I need milk. I need milk. I need love. I need protection. I need security. I need to live. I need to reproduce. I need enough. We got born into those models. That's how we all end up being here. You couldn't be in that manifestation if you didn't play along with the game. Look what happened to Ramana Maharshi. At 17, he, he sees through the system, and then he goes into a temple and he just sits there. And the kids throw turds at him and rocks and ants eat him and eh, he couldn't care less. He's just... Well, if he started that at uh, one month old, he wouldn't be around. On Arunachala, he wouldn't have been around. Because those at one month are called blue babies and they don't make it. Poor baby didn't make it. <laughs> you never know, you know. <laughs> Born into a package. And in order for the package to work, you have to identify with the components of the package. You have to identify with its input and output, its senses and orifices. And you have to identify with its control mechanism, its mind, its thinking mind. Its thinking mind. And so you come through the trip and you've been going along merrily thinking cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. That's who I am. I'm my thinking, my sensing, my body. I am this trip. And then the new baby starts to be heard from by one way or another, because this was the birth in which it happened. How many rounds were there's the veil too thick in which there was no possibility that this would happen? That if you came into this room by mistake, which is the only way you get in here, 
you would say, what kind of nonsense is he talking about? And they're all sitting there listening. What kind of junk is this? But it doesn't make any sense to me. He's talking nonsense. Nonsense. Nonsense, right. Nonsense. Let he who has ears hear. To he who knows, no explanation is necessary. To he who does not, none is possible. None is possible. Yeah. You can't come on to somebody and say, wake up, there is a baby within you. <laughs> when you come on to other people, they come on to you. And that's when the nails hurt. See, the Jesus story is the story of coming on to other people. That's not Christ, that's Jesus. Christ just lived out the Jesus story. He went around turning over the tables in the temple. Man, turn over the tables, this is no way to do it, there's a baby in you. Did that make the people who were sitting at the tables, being users in the temple, say, oh, we've been terribly bad. We'll never do that again, sir. You figure? I don't think that's the way it works, do you? It seems to me that in nature, the laws of action and reaction hold right across the board. They hold in cells and in energy and in humans and in social nations, institutions of all kinds. Law of action and reaction. If you're going to play in nature, you've got to live by the laws of nature. But that baby that's been born in you isn't in nature. Go ahead and find him. Where do you think you're going to cut to find him? You think you'll find a little homunculus? Where do you think you'll find it? You think up here? Open it up and find, like... Well, there's the ego. We'll move that aside. Behind the ego. Ah, there you are. Think down here. Where? Think when you open the spine, you're going to find the chakras? You still insist it's all on this plane, huh? Well, the most interesting stuff has nothing to do with that. You're not going to localize you in time and space because you just happen to be living in a package that's in time and space, but you aren't in time and space. But most of you still are hyped into this identification that you're in time and space. Yeah, I always do this simple experiment with myself and with everybody else. Called the here and now trip. I always like it, see. Where are you? I'm here. What time is it? It's now. Okay, let's try 3.37 tomorrow morning. I call you on the phone. Hello? Where are you? I'm here. What time is it? It's now. Thank you. Go back to sleep. 8.14 tomorrow morning. Alarm goes off. Big sign in front of the alarm. Where are you? Here. What time is it? Now. 2.18 tomorrow afternoon? How about 4.16 next Thursday? How about 11.47 on April 13th? Where do you think you'll be? Has it ever dawned on you that you're going to be here and it's going to be now? <laughs> See, it makes it much simpler because that's what's known as the eternal present. You're always here and it's always now. <laughs> Go as you might. You're running, you're running, you're running. It's like running on a treadmill. I'll get away from here. <laughs> you ever try it? I'd be hung up in Chicago, so I'd say, well, I'll fly to L.A. <laughs> and I'd fly to L.A. and I'd be hung up in L.A. Because in the here and now, I was hung up. It had nothing to do with Chicago 
or L.A. or anything out there for that matter. So that baby lives in the here and now, the eternal present. The baby, okay. the baby is eternally wise. It's every age. There's a beautiful quote from this book. Another quote that I, the one I usually use, from a book called Mount Analog, which is a lovely little book. And in Mount Analog, uh, the captain has brought this group on a metaphorical trip into higher consciousness. And he brings them to the base of the mountain they're going to climb. And he's brought them through a great deal. He's been their teacher and their guide. See, the thing to do with energy, that's all free energy being handed to us by this being, that part of us. Just take the energy and move it up your spine. You know, crying, fire engines, airplanes, like, yeah, and you can get high off it all. It's all free energy being handed to you. You sit around saying, I wish that baby would stop. Man, I'd be climbing the walls if I sat there like that. Instead of like, wow, oh, thank you. Yeah, oh, boy. It's all free. I, I lectured for three, gave Darshan for three weeks in New York City on 3rd Avenue and 77th Street. And the fire engines just kept going back and like, and you, oh, wow. Man, we were all stoned by the end of the evening. Free from the city of New York. How do you like that? See, Meister Eckhart's right. <laughs> you know how to do it, it all works. See? That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> but I'm doing it slow. <laughs> we have three evenings. <laughs> and nothing to say. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you. <laughs>